our lecture today is very important, which is hypertensive disorders of a pregnancy. This is very important. Why? Because hypertensive disorder of a pregnancy is a leading cause of death in developed countries and the second most important cause of maternal death in developing countries after postpartum hemorrhage. Now, by definition, hypertension is defined as changes of blood pressure recorded on at least on two occasions, 15 minutes apart, up to four hours apart. We see that if we have a raise in diastolic blood pressures of 90 millimeter mercury and above, and or a raise in systolic blood pressures of 140 millimeter mercury and above, we consider it as a hypertension. Or if we have a raise in diastolic blood pressure of at least 15 millimeter mercury or a raise in systolic blood pressure of at least 30 millimeter mercury if we compare it with blood pressure measurements in early booking or in uh, early pregnancy. What does it mean? Suppose we have a woman, she is uh, 12 weeks pregnant and we measure her blood pressure and it was 100 over 60 and we re-measure it after 20 weeks gestation and we see that the systolic blood pressure is 130. It means that there is an increase 30 millimeter mercury or a diastolic increase 75. It means that 15 millimeter mercury above the baseline. This woman is considered to be high risk for developing hypertension in coming days. Now, what are the degree of hypertension according to the blood pressure measurements? Mild hypertension, it means that there is a diastolic blood pressure of 90 to 99 and systolic blood pressure of 140 to 149. Moderate hypertension, it means that diastolic blood pressure is 100 to 109 or a systolic blood pressure 150 to 159. While severe hypertension, it means that diastolic blood pressure is 110 millimeter mercury and above and, syst and or systolic blood pressure of 160 millimeter mercury and above. And this classification is still there in the by Royal College. But the American College, they considered hypertension according to the measurements into severe and non-severe hypertension. Now, if we see this graph, we see that during a pregnancy, we have two times decrease in the blood pressure in, uh, from 12 weeks up to 28 weeks. And this is considered as the two wave of invasions of a trophoplastic tissue into the maternal circulation. That's why, that's why we choose, by definition, we choose a 20 week gestation as a cutoff line or cutoff points in all definitions of hypertensive disorders of a pregnancy because we consider this point is a changing point in the measurement of blood pressure. Now, how to measure blood pressure during pregnancy? And this is very important. Now, measurements of blood pressure during pregnancy recommended to measure it in a sitting position using left or right, mainly on the left, and we put all in the same level, the instruments, the sphygmomanometers, the calf, and to the level of the heart. If we measure it on the right or on the left, we consider the highest one more reliable if we measure it on the left and on the right, and on the left shows to be more we consider it, this reading is more reliable than the low, the low uh, measurements. Or we can measure it while the patient's in supine position, but we have to tilt the patient to the left. Why? To overcome the risk of supine hypotension syndrome, which means that the effect of the gravid uterus on the inferior vena cava, which will decrease the return of the blood to the maternal circulations and since it will uh, produce a supine hypotension syndrome. So we have two positions to measure, either in the sitting positions or in a supine positions, but we have to tell the patients to overcome the risk of supine hypotension syndrome. Classifications of hypertension. We have 
pregnancy induced hypertension, we have chronic hypertension, we have preeclampsia, we have eclampsia, and we have imminent eclampsia, or what we call it, fulminating preeclampsia. And all of them we will speak about uh, in detail. Coming to pregnancy induced hypertension, or also we call it non proteinuric pregnancy induced hypertension, or we call it gestational hypertension. All is the same. What does it mean? By definition, it means that hypertension arising for the first time in the second half of pregnancy and in the absence of proteinuria or any other features of preeclampsia. It means that there is a raise in the blood pressures after 20 weeks of gestation with no protein in urine or any other clinical or biochemical features of uh, severe or, or of preeclampsia. Now, it is not associated with adverse pregnancy outcome. And mild and moderate increase in the blood pressure in this setting do not require treatments. But the risk of it is what? One third of women who present with gestational hypertension will progress to preeclampsia. So we have to keep it in mind. Although the woman is gestational hypertension, but this woman is vulnerable to have preeclampsia or to pass to preeclampsia in up to 30 to 35 percent of the cases. What about chronic hypertension? It is pre-existing hypertension, may be diagnosed before pregnancy or assumed when a woman is found to be hypertensive in early pregnancy. It can predispose to later developments of superimposed preeclampsia. And even in the absence of superimposed preeclampsia, a chronic hypertension is associated with an increased maternal and fetal morbidity, and pregnancy complicated by chronic hypertension should therefore be regarded as high risk. What does it mean? It means that if we handle a woman in early pregnancy and we measure the blood pressure in any weeks before 20 weeks of gestation, and we find it to be elevated, this woman have chronic hypertension, whether there is a protein in urine or there is no protein in urea. This woman with the chronic hypertension is high-risk woman, even in the absence of superimposed preeclampsia, which this woman is vulnerable to have it. Coming to the most severe form of hypertensive disorder of a pregnancy is preeclampsia, and this is very important subject. Preeclampsia is defined as hypertension of at least 140 over 90 millimeter mercury recorded on two separate occasions at least four hours apart and with a protein in urea, which means that at least 300 milligram of protein is found in collections of urine over 24 hours, arising for the first time after 20 weeks of gestation in a previously normal tensive woman and this blood pressure will resolve by six weeks postpartum. So all these conditions should be present if we want to define preeclampsia. So she had elevations of blood pressure with a protein in urea. After 20 weeks of gestation, as we said, 20 weeks is a cutoff point in a previously normal tensive woman. And the blood pressure will return back to normal after the end of perperium. This is what we call it preeclampsia. What about eclampsia? Eclampsia, again, is a very important topic. Eclampsia may be considered as severe form of preeclampsia, or we consider it as a separate entity of hypertensive disorders of a pregnancy. It is a serious and life-threatening complications of preeclampsia. It is defined as convulsions, occurring in a woman with established preeclampsia, I mean women known to have preeclampsia, although sometimes the woman may present for the first time during pregnancy with eclampsia as a manifestation of preeclampsia. And in the absence of any other neurological or metabolic cause of convulsion, what does it mean? I mean the woman is not previously having epilepsy or space-occupying lesions, 
having uh, diabetes and DKA and electrolyte disturbances, which all these causes are a causes of uh, convulsions. This condition is an obstetrical emergency, so this is very important. What about imminent eclampsia or fulminating preeclampsia? It means that is, this is a severe form of preeclampsia, and if we will not treat her well and uh, managing her well, this woman will pass by sure to what? To eclampsia. So is a transitional condition characterized by increasing symptoms and signs, and it is a severe form of preeclampsia. Coming to preeclampsia, we will speak about in details because it is a very important topic. It complicates approximately 2 to 3 percent of a pregnancy. It is more common in the primary gravida woman because of the effect of the paternal genome. And there is genetic predisposition from the maternal side. It means that the woman will have a three to four folds increase in first degree relative of affected women. Now, what are the risk factors of preeclampsia or what are the predisposing factors for preeclampsia? Primary gravida women, multipara women, but she had a previous history of preeclampsia or preeclampsia in any previous pregnancy. Old age women, 40 years and above, obese women with a body mass index of 35 and more, or last pregnancy before 10 years. Family history of preeclampsia, as we said, she had elevations of blood pressures and proteinuria in the, in the early pregnancy, and multiple pregnancy or triple pregnancy, and we have certain underlying medical conditions as pre-existing hypertension, pre-existing renal disease, pre-existing diabetes, and antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. How the woman with preeclampsia presents? They may be asymptomatic and discovered accidentally. They may present with headache, blurring of vision and visual disturbances, epigastric pain, and right hypochondrial pain. So please, if any woman handled for the first time came with headache, uh, blaring of vision, epigastric pain, and right hypochondrial pain, take the opportunity to measure her blood pressure and rule out hypertension during pregnancy. What about signs of preeclampsia? We see that there is elevations of blood pressure by measurements. There will be fluid retentions by odyma, and we consider two types of odyma is very important, which is first, non-dependent odyma, which occurs in the hand and in the face, and rapidly increasing oedema. We have brisk reflexes, mainly the patellar reflexes. We have uncle clonus, it three beats and above, and we will see in the next pictures. And if we have a small for gestational age by uh, obstetrical examination. These are the most important things in the examination. Measurement of blood pressure with albumin in urine, rapidly increasing weight, Non-dependent odyma, we see that there is hand odyma. Sometimes they even remove the rings. They may present with severe manifestation as headache, as blurring of vision, as epigastric pain with nausea and vomiting. Now, which, is, which odyma is more significant, on the left or on the right? This is dependent and this is non-dependent odyma. So on the right is more significant since it is non-dependent odyma. You see that we see here that the woman cannot take the ring out because of the non-dependent odyma or swelling of the hands. What are the causes of preeclampsia? Although exact cause of it is unknown, but the trophoplastic tissue by itself or by invasion is a major cause of preeclampsia. Trophoplastic tissue provides the stimulus for the disorder. So it only occurs in a pregnancy, but it has been described in a pregnancy with no fetus or in even a pregnancy outside the uterus, as in abdominal pregnancy. Or it may be due to abnormal invasions of a trophoplastic tissue into the maternal circulation. So this invasion will be patchy, more than diffuse, and the spinal arteries retain their muscular wall, which in turn prevent the development of high flow 
اللي هو يميز السيركوليشنز اوف ذا بلاسينتا اند لو امبيدنس يوترو بلاسينتا سيركوليشن اند ذا ريزن فور ذس ابنورمال انفيجن از يت نوت نون سو ذا باثو فيزيولوجيز اوف ات از ملتيبل ليفلز مي بي جينيتيك مي بي ايميولوجيكال مي بي ديفيشنس از وي سيد بتروفوبلاستيك انفيجن وذ هايبوبيرفيوجن there may be circulating factors and vascular endothelial cell activation till they, they will have a, a clear-cut pictures of the disease. And we can roughly classify it into stage 1 and stage 2. Stage 1 with abnormal immune response and deficient placentations and 2 with maternal endothelial cell dysfunction leading to maternal syndrome. Coming to the organ-specific changes associated with the preeclampsia, we have to know that preeclampsia will affect many organs, starting from above, down, starting from the central nervous system and coming down. Central nervous system, we may see cerebral oedema by ophthalmological examination. They may, may manifest with citroc by cerebral hemorrhage. They, we may have a retinal hemorrhage and even retinal detachments in severe form, which is irreversible. And we can see by ophthalmoscopical examinations, exodate and papillodema are characteristic features of severe form, what we call it as a hypertensive encephalopathy. Coming down to cardiovascular manifestation, we will see a generalized vasospasm with increased peripheral resistance reduce central venous and pulmonary wedge pressures to clear cut or clear pictures of even heart failure. And we have in hematological, we have platelet activation and depletion. We will see thrombocytopenia, coagulopathy in the form of DIC, decreased plasma volume and increased blood viscosity. We have a renal problem. There will be a proteinuria, as we said, with decreased glomerular filtration rate and decreased urate excretions, and we will have, by investigation, increase in serum uric acids till we have a renal failure, which is, again, irreversible. Coming to the liver, we have liver. There will be a periportal necrosis, subcapsular hematoma with significant elevations of liver enzymes. That's why this woman may have a right hypochondrial pain. They, manifest, they may manifest with a right hypochondrial pain. And also, we forget this one thing, which is, a renal, which is a respiratory complication, sorry, which is one of a leading cause of death, what we call it as adult respiratory distress syndrome. Coming to the HELP syndrome. What is HELP syndrome? HELP syndrome is a severe form of preeclampsia. Occur in 2 to 4 percent of women with preeclampsia. It is associated with fetal loss rate of up to 60 percent if occur antenatally and up to 24 percent mortality rate. It may be associated with DIC, which means disseminated intravascular coagulopathy and placental abruptions. The abbreviations of it comes from H. Uh, H from hemolysis, EL from elevated liver enzymes, and LP from low platelet count. How we diagnose preeclampsia? Whenever we consider, uh, we see a woman with elevations of blood pressure after 20 weeks of gestation with albumin in urine, this is a preeclampsia and necessitate admissions of the patients in the hospital. Mumkin wahid yisal. Even if she was a mild case, I said yes. Even if she was mild case, moderate and severe. Why? Because even if it was a mild case, this woman may pass very rapidly to have a fulminating case, severe form, even eclampsia, even health, uh, even uh, subcapsular hematoma, severe form of preeclampsia. So it needs admissions of the patients with a careful follow-up and monitoring. Coming to the diagnosis of a mild form, as we said, there is elevations of blood pressure between 90 to 95 with a protein in urine, minimal protein in urine. We have one plus. 
and all other biochemical and hematological indices are normal. Patients should be admitted, but after to take in consideration of everything, then we will can discharge her, but with meticulous follow-up for the fetal side and for the maternal side. Moderate hype, moderate preeclampsia, it means that there is elevations of blood pressure from 95 to 105. And it requires admission to the hospital for very careful follow-up and to send all the investigations of uh, preeclampsia, as we will see in the next slides. What about severe preeclampsia? Is identified by symptoms of severe preeclampsia, which is headache, blaring of vision, epigastric pain or right hypochondrial pain, nausea and vomiting, and restlessness. Patient is irritable, she may pain. And signs of severe preeclampsia, she may be agitated, hyperreflexia, and clonus, and they may be a non-dependent oedema or rapidly increasing oedema. They may present with the right upper quadrant tenderness by palpations, and even they may even present with decrease in urine output. What is hyperreflexia? If we examine patellar reflexes, normally the patellar reflexes is present. But if there is a hyperreflexes, it means that there is this is a sign of hypertension. What is the clonus? Clonus is a dorsiflexion of the ankle joint, and we leave it. So there will be what? There will be a jerky movement. If this jerky movement is more than three and more, this we call it a clonus test positive, which is again one of severe signs of preeclampsia. Coming to investigation. What are the investigations of women with preeclampsia we should send her for? This investigation will be repeated at interval depending on the overall clinical picture, as you will see. We have to send for urine. We can do dipstick, but it will not give a quantitative measurement. So quantitative measurements need collections of urine over 24 hours. So 24-hour urine collection for total proteinuria and creatinine clearances. Full blood count to see the PCV and the platelet count. Blood chemistry, we have a renal function test and protein concentration. Plasma urate concentration, as we said, urate will be increases. Liver function test, SGOT, SGPT, and alkaline phosphatase. Coagulation profile, which is a profile of five, as we know, uh, PT, PTT, platelet, fibrinogen, and we have fibrin degradation product. And we have ultrasounds for fetal size and medical fluid volume and Doppler for assessments of a fetal well-being. So these investigations, we should send the women with a preeclampsia for when we admit the patients. And we will see in the next slide how frequent we will send these investigations for these women. Now, what is the protein in urine? As we said, we have a qualitative and we have a quantitative. Pipistic urine analysis will not give a picture of a quantitative. We can see 1 plus, we can see 2 plus, and we have to consider whether 1 plus or 2 plus in consideration if we, take, if we have elevations of blood pressure. Protein creatinine ratio and collections of urine over 24 hours, as we said, is a quantitative measurement. And we, if, we have, uh, uh, if we have a 300 milligram of, or over 24 hours, is confirmed significant proteinuria. What are the maternal complications of preeclampsia? Again, from up to down. Increase maternal morbidity and mortality. Increase fetal morbidity and mortality. Coming to increase maternal morbidity and mortality. Coming from above, cerebral oedema, cerebral hemorrhage, retinal hemorrhage, and eclampsia. Coming down, we have heart failure, pulmonary edema, and adult respiratory distress syndrome. And these CNS and cardiopulmonary is the leading cause of maternal mortality. And if we have this complication, we should consider terminations of pregnancies of whatever weeks of gestation. Subcapsular hematoma with periportal necrosis and elevated liver enzymes 
This is a liver complications. We have a renal failure. And put in mind always and always, if we have elevated blood urea and serum creatine, again, we have to consider terminations of pregnancy regardless of the weeks of gestations. Why? Because the changes is irreversible. There will be a tubular necrosis, which is irreversible. And we have a hematological complication, which is very important. If we send for investigations, I will see a low platelets count. I will see a hemolysis by blood film. I will see a coagulopathy and DIC, as I mentioned, a five test, which is PT again, PTT, platelets count, serum fibrinogen, and fibrin degradation products. And also we will have a health syndrome, as I said, which is a hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelet counts. And we have an increased risk of a thrombosis of whatever, whether DVT, whether pulmonary embolism. And we have an increased risk of antipartum hemorrhage and after delivery of postpartum hemorrhage. And lastly, we have an increased risk of surgical interventions. Why? Because this woman, as I said, necessitates termination, whether by cesarean section, whether by using an instrumental delivery. Coming to the fetal complication, as I said, there is an increased perinatal morbidity and mortality because of preterm delivery, because it will be iatrogenic, because of IUGR, IUD, and even one of the causes of birth asphyxia. How to treat? The mainstay of a treatment is ending the pregnancy by delivering the fetus and the placenta. This can be a significant problem if the baby was preterm, especially between 24 till 32 weeks of gestation because of risk of complications of prematurity. So the actual treatment, the, the, the most important step is to deliver. But in a preterm uh, pregnancy, this is problematic. The aim of antihypertensive therapy is to lower the blood pressure and reduce the risk of maternal cerebral vascular accident without reducing uterine blood flow and compromising the fetus. So if we cannot deliver, we have to have an aim, we have to give the patients antihypertensive therapy. Why? To keep the blood pressures on, under control. What are the antihypertensive drugs can be used in preeclampsia to control the blood pressure? On the top of the list, we have the methyl dopa. How it acts? It's a centrally acting antihypertensive agent. It is safe, can only be given orally, no parenteral route, needs at least 24 hours to work. That's why sometimes we start with a high dose. And the drug of choice antenatally, although now by the Royal College, Labitol substitute methyl dopa, and it is the drug of choice in preeclampsia. Is an alpha and beta blocking agents. It can be given orally throughout the pregnancy, and we can give it in acute phase of treatments by giving it IV. It is safe, can be given antenatally and intrapartum by infusion to control the blood pressure in severe preeclampsia. For three, we have nifedipine, which is calcium channel blocking agents with a rapid onset of action. It can, however, cause severe headache, that mammic worsening disease. So if we give it, we cannot know that this headache or blurring of vision is because of the disease or because of the side effect of the drug. Hydrolyzine, a mechanism of actions is arterial vasodilator. We use it IV or we use it orally, but we use it in acute phase treatments, mainly in severe preeclampsia and trapartum. So severe form of preeclampsia necessitates IV infusion of hydrolyzine versus labitalol. Some centers use hydrolyzine till now, but as I said, the drug of choice is labitalol. And we titrate it rapidly against changes in blood pressure. I mean, we give it slowly and we control or we measure the blood pressure frequently till we reach control of blood pressure. This is the drug of choice. Uh, most centers, they use it. We have a methyl dopa, which is aldomate. We have two doses. We have 
250 and we have 500 milligram. This graph or this table is very important. Classifications of it, as we said, we have a mild, we have a moderate, we have severe. And as I said, even mild necessitate admission. A drug of choice, as I said, is what? Is labitalol. Although mild hypertension necessitate no treatment. We should measure the blood pressure every four hours. Every four hours. But in severe form, we have to measure it more frequent. We test for albumin in urine once only. There is no need for repeat. A blood test, we can do it in mild form twice per week which is, as I said, all the investigation mentions above. But in moderate form, we use it, we can uh, send for three times a week. And in severe form, we can send three times a week or even more according to the circumstances. This is the labitalol. As I said, is the drug of choice by the Royal College. This is the tablets. Uh, there is two doses, aquabul 100, aquabul 200. And we have a labitalol, which is 100 milligram in 20 ml. Uh, ampoule or bottle, small bottle. Now, suppose we have a woman uh, presented to the casualties with eclampsia. I mean, convulsions, tonic clonic convulsion. How should I measure? Always and always remember in eclampsia the ABC, which means maintain the airway, breathings, and circulation. So maintain an open airway by mouthpiece and good oxygenation. Maintain two IV lines and take blood samples for all investigations that we mentioned. Then we control the fit by giving magnesium sulfate. How we give it? We give it by IV bullous dose directly. And then we continue on magnesium sulfate over 24 hours from the last fit. Then we control blood pressure by, by, as we said, hydrolyzine versus labitalol IV. With closed observations of vital signs, pulse rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure, temperature, we have to notice the urine output, measure or examine the patellar reflexes and the clonus. Meanwhile, we assess the fetal conditions, and whenever we have eclampsia, arja marathani escort, is one of the indications of imminent delivery after stabilizations of the general conditions of the women. This is the magnesium sulfate, is a gold standard uh, drugs in the management of eclampsia. This is the magnesium sulfate. How it acts? Centrally acting anticonvulsant. It acts as a membrane stabilizing agent. Can be given IV or IM, but Always remember that preferably IV, and I will mention why. It is the drug of choice, the first drug of choice whenever we have convulsion in acute phase treatment of eclampsia. How we give it? 4 to 6 gram IV slowly over 10 minutes to a rest fit. Then we maintain on 1 gram per hour IV drip for at least, as I said, 24 hours from the last fit. And we have to very carefully monitor the women with it. So, magnesium sulfate should be monitored carefully. Why? While giving it because of its toxicity. How we monitor? Measuring its level in the blood if it is available. Monitoring the following. We have a respiratory rate. We have urine output. And we have the patellar reflexes. This, is, this slide is very important. If we keep the women on or the patients on magnesium sulfate, we have to measure the respiratory rate. Why? Because as I said, magnesium sulfate is a centrally acting agent. So it will cause inhibition. So it may cause what? Respiratory arrest. That's why we have to monitor respiratory rate. And because the magnesium sulfate is excreted by the kidney, and the disease affect the kidney. So we have to put our eyes always on the urine output because if there is a decrease in urine output, the toxicity of magnesium sulfate will increase. So we have to decrease the rate of it and even stop it. And we have to always and always monitor the women by examining the patellar reflexes, which is 
the patella reflex, which is the first sign to disappear in magnesium sulfate toxicity. So if we see it decrease or absence, this is the first sign. It means that we have to stop and even to, to give antidote if we have a blood level toxicity. What is the antidote of magnesium sulfate is calcium gluconate, giving 10% over 10 minutes, 10 ml. And we call it the rule of 10. 10%, 10 ml over 10 minutes, and we give it IV. Additional points in the management of uh, severe preeclampsia. Management of severe preeclampsia that, that necessitate delivery in a woman less than 34 weeks. Suppose I have a woman, she had severe preeclampsia before 34 weeks. What are the important points we should take it in consideration? The mother should be transferred to a center with adequate facilities to care for her baby. It means that if I am in a primary health center or secondary health center, I have to refer the patients to tertiary health center. But uh, while I am referring her, I should take in consideration all the precautions in the referral. Steroids should be given intramuscularly to the mother to reduce the chance of neonatal RDS from prematurity. Delivery before term is often by cesarean section uh, uh, why? Because the bishop score, the cervix, is unfavorable. So there will be a long journey. So cesarean section is preferable. Such patients are at particular high risk of thromboembolism, as we said. And sh we should give a prophylactic subcutaneous heparin and uh, uh, antithrombotic, antithromboembolic stocking. But we have to give it 8 to 12 hours after cesarean section. In the case of spontaneous or induced labor, and if clotting studies are normal, epidural anesthesia is indicated as it helps control blood pressure. What is the method of anesthesia preferable if cesarean section or if vaginal delivery? I will say epidural anesthesia, but we should have coagulations profile normal. Ergometrine is contraindicated in the management of third stage of labor as it can significantly increase blood pressure. Key points. Preeclampsia is a multi-system disorder that likely originates in the placenta and is a significant cause of maternal and prenatal morbidity and mortality. There is no cure other than delivery. And the aim of management is to stabilize maternal blood pressure and prevent seizure and cerebral bleeding. Coming to chronic hypertension. Chronic hypertension, uh, the common cause of it is essential hypertension, as we know, in 90% of the cases. But before a diagnosis of essential hypertension is made, other causes of chronic hypertension should be excluded, which are renal cause, glomerulonephritis, polycystic disease, diabetic nephropathy, renal artery stenosis, co collagen vascular disease, which is SLE and scleroderma, coarctations of the aorta, endocrine causes, which is pheochromocytoma and Crohn's disease. Irrespective of the underlying cause, the principal concern is that these women may develop superimposed preeclampsia in up to one-third of the cases. How to treat? Mild form of it, no need for immediate treatment. However, the pregnancy should be monitored carefully to detect any rays in the blood pressure or features of preeclampsia or IUGR. Moderate antihypertension Medication is recommended, which includes, again, methyl dopa, lapidolol, and nifedipine. The aim of a treatment in chronic hypertension is to maintain blood pressure below 160 and diastolic below 100 to 110. It is reasonable to wait spontaneous labor or attempt vaginal delivery by induction at 39 weeks. It means if everything is going well, we can pass till 39 weeks, 39 weeks, if ripe cervix, consider vaginal delivery. What are the risk factors for developing superimposed preeclampsia and chronic hypertension, renal disease, old age, 
if the woman have diabetic, if she had twin pregnancy, if she's a case of uh, antiphospholipid syndrome, whether primary or secondary, coaptations of the aorta, if the blood pressure is high from the beginning, if, if the woman is obese, previous preeclampsia, and antiphospholipid syndrome. Quiz. I put down four scenario, and I am waiting for the answers of them. First one, a 40 years old woman in her first pregnancy presents in labor. Her blood pressure is 145 over 90. Shortly after beginning uterine contraction, she has ectonic clonic seizures. What is your diagnosis? A 32 years old woman presents with epigastric pain at 38 week gestation in her second pregnancy. Her first pregnancy had been complicated by preeclampsia. Her blood pressure now is 130 over 86. She has elevations of liver function tests and she had a low platelet count. Scenario 3. 24 years old woman in her first pregnancy presents at 32 weeks gestation with sudden onset severe abdominal pain and vaginal bleeding. Her blood pressure is 160 over 95. So the woman presents with vaginal bleeding. A 36 years old woman in her first pregnancy is noted to have blood pressure of 140 over, 80, uh, over 86 after two weeks gestation and there is no protein in urea in her urine and she is asymptomatic. What is your diagnosis? Thank you so much.